Hello everyone, now I'm going to react to uh, episode 40 of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Here, John Verveke starts to talk about wisdom, and uh, this is a very, very valuable topic, and uh, I hope that you will get a lot out of it. I have uh, made several attempts on recording this uh, video before, and uh, have not been able to due to uh, factors such as uh, being too tired or uh, technical issues. So um, I think that I might have a bit, a bit better commentary on this one than I do on other ones. And let's jump into it. Welcome back to Awakening from Meaning Crisis. So last time I tried to uh, make some tentative suggestions as to what um, this religion that's not a religion uh, would look like and how it can make use of and be integrated with um, uh, an ecology of psychotechnologies for addressing the perennial problems and a cognitive scientific uh, worldview. Um, that can legitimate uh, and situate uh, that ecology of practices. And then I made some suggestions as to uh, the relationship between uh, credo and religio in our determination of our mythos and the issue of criterion setting. I made, an, again, another argument for uh, open-ended, in that sense, Gnostic uh, mythos talked about uh, a mythos that uh, always puts, therefore, the credo in service of the religio and that is always directed towards, right, top down, the propositional being ultimately grounded in, in the participatory and also affording the emergence up out of the participatory through the perspectival and procedural into the, the propositional. Um, I suggest in some ways in which we might uh, set up uh, a way of engineering a credo, something analogous to a wiki, uh, and create a structure that is a distributed uh, co-op structure facilitated by things like the internet. Um, and so, <clears throat> uh, Again, remind you, I was not trying to uh, offer anything definitive or set myself up in any kind of way. That is not what I want to do. I want to try and help facilitate the people who are already doing this so that they have ways of talking to each other, co co coordinating with each other, um, and facilitating each other's development. And yeah, in this respect, he is actually in this respect, he's done pretty well. Uh, he's definitely uh, really helped build communities up like this. And uh, the sad thing, though, that I've found with all of the communities, which isn't his fault, is that a lot of them aren't very well archived. Uh, I strongly expect that... Uh, I strongly expect that... Uh, my interpretations of him are going to become uh, are going to be some of the ones that survive the most in a kind of way that the thought of Socrates is very uh, well known, but the thought of Plato is very is very well known because uh, I this is this is only a couple of years down the line and. A huge amount of uh, the uh, data on awakening from the meaning crisis has always has already been lost. But, uh, yeah, he's definitely do put in a very very noble effort. Growth. I then turned towards um, one of the uh, culminating things we need to do picking up on one of the deepest relationships between meaning, uh, sorry, one of the deepest relationships that meaning has, uh, which is the relationship between meaning and wisdom. We need wisdom, of course, uh, 
to, to as I've argued, because it's the, the meta virtue uh, for the virtues. <coughs> and uh, we need that in order to give the individual pull for the relationship with the, the collective uh, creation and cultivation of the meta-psychotechnology uh, for creating uh, the ecology of psychotechnology. We also, of course, need wisdom before, <laughs> during, um, and after uh, the quest for enlightenment, the quest for a systematic and reliable response to the perennial problems. I then propose to take a look at the cognitive science of wisdom. And we did that by taking note of an important article that comes out sort of after the first decade and a half of the resurgence of scientific interest in wisdom. And that's the article of McGee and Barber. And they're doing something consonant with what we've been trying to do in this um, series. They're trying to, in a sense, salvage what we can from the philosophical theories, the legacy and the axial age of wisdom and the psychological theories that were emerging uh, at that time. <clears throat> and then they set them into dialogue with each other, a, a process of reflective equilibrium, uh, trying to get a uh, convergence between them. And they argue that all of these theories, the philosophical and the psychological theories, converge on a, a feature, a central feature of wisdom. Um, and, and then following work that I did with Leo Ferraro in uh, 2013, we can sort of expand beyond the I explicit thing to what is um, also said alongside their phrase and also directly implied by their phrase. And so a central feature of wisdom is to systematic, the systematically, sorry, the systematic seeing through illusion and into reality, at least comparatively so. And this, of course, is insight, but it is a fundamental insight. It is a, a systematic insight. It is an insight not just into a particular problem, but into a family of problems. And the McGee and Barber make use of um, a point that I made use of when I was talking about systematic insight in higher states of consciousness. Uh, they make use of the work of Piaget. If you remember, Piaget found systematic errors in the way children are seeing the world. Remember, things like they fail at conservation tasks, counting numbers or pouring liquids, right? So you have these systematic errors uh, which reflect a systematic way in which the children have uh, over-constrained their cognition. They're, they have to constrain their cognition. It's adaptive, but they have to go through right, that process of assimilation and accommodation, constantly optimizing and complexifying um, th their system of constraints. But what we see with the children is eventually they get a systematic insight. And we've all done it. We go through qualitative change, qualitative development. There's an actual change in our competence. Because it's not an insight into this problem, or this instance where I'm failing to conserve, or this instance, or this instance where I'm ego egocentric, or this instance, but it's a insight into failures of conservation as a kind of error, failures of egocentrism as a kind of error, and having a insight that is not just at the level of framing, but at the level of transframing, because it not only is reframing the problem. It is transforming my, cons co my competence. So it is a transframing insight. It is a systematic insight. Because what it gives you is sensibility transcendence. That's literally what's happening to the children. Their sensibility is going through a form of transcendence. That's exactly what uh, development is. And they use that as a way of explaining what they mean. Of course, without realizing it, they're making use of one of the paradigmatic metaphors for talking about wisdom, which is as the child is to the adult, right? The adult 
is to the sage. Just like the adult has had systematic transframing, gone through development so that in a, in, a, in, a, in a way compared to the child, they much more systematically see through illusion and into what's real, the sage, right, similarly in comparison to an adult, right, sees systematically through in a transframing fashion, illusion and into reality. So this is a core constitutive feature of what it is to be wise. And you can see something, and this is not something the McGee and Barber say, okay? But you can see how this is automatically, I would argue, I would argue, they're not, but I would argue this is automatically, you know, connected to the project of enlightenment in some very important uh, fashion. All right. What are a couple other important things that McGee and Barber uh, talk about? They talk about that wisdom, and this is the beginning of the important distinction between wisdom and knowledge that we've been sort of uh, also making use of throughout the course. That wisdom is not about what you know. Wisdom has to do with how you know it. And there's two senses of how that I want to explicate that they leave rather implicit. Yeah, and I, yeah, not what you know, but how you know it is a, uh, it's it's an important way to link it to the having mode, rather than, sorry, the being mode rather than the having mode. Right. There's how you know it is, is how you have come to know it. What's the processing involved as opposed to the product? So wisdom has a lot more to do with the process than with the product. Knowledge is right often the product. Well, I know, I, this is what I know, and I know this, and this, and this, but wisdom is, how am I knowing? How am I knowing? Right? So definitely that, and that's going to be pivotal, because, th and that's going to immediately link wisdom to rationality, because one of the key features of rationality, I've mentioned this before, we're going to come back to this, the work of Stanovich, is uh, a, a rational person is not only fixated on the products of their cognition, they pay attention to and find value the processing of their cognition. That's what it is to be rational. Right, so that's one aspect of what they mean by the how. And then there's another aspect of how you know. And that has to do, and this goes uh, to a point made by Keeks, uh, between descriptive, John Keeks, excellent philosopher, does work on wisdom, right? But Keeks makes uh, uh, a distinction between descriptive knowledge and interpretive knowledge. I, I often prefer to use the word knowing rather than knowledge, but that, that's his way of talking about. <clears throat> so again, this is you know, grasping the facts. Where is interpretive knowledge, this points towards an, an, an aspect of wisdom that we're going to have to come back to. This has to do with understanding. This is to grasp the significance of what you know. And of course, relevance realization is being invoked. Uh, they're grasping the significance, right? Connecting to the, the relevance realization. But so grasp, uh, understanding is grasping the significance. So part of what we're talking about with wisdom, and we're talking about the how rather than the what you know, we're talking about the process rather than the product, and we're talking not about right, the, 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 the description of the facts, right, but we're talking about you grasping, understanding by grasping the significance of the facts that you have. So wisdom has to do with these things. It has deep connections to understanding, again, uh, which has to do with uh, the relevance realization. It has to do with the process rather than the product, right? And that is all tied into this, right, this systematic transframing uh, realization of what's real. They then point to uh, one other important um, feature of wisdom. They point out um, there's a perspectival participatory aspect to wisdom. Um, uh, they talk about uh, a, a, what's called a, a pragmatic self-contradiction. A pragmatic self-contradiction is not a contradiction in what you state. It's a contradiction in how, in, in the perspective from which you make the statement and the identity 
uh, the, the degree of identity you have in making the statement. L let, let me give you a non-controversial example. Okay, so I am asleep. There is nothing logically wrong with that. If I'm pointing to the fact of John being asleep, you can, there's, there's, no, there's no conceptual contradiction in John being asleep. This is a pragmatic self-contradiction because uttering it means I have a, I'm uttering it from the, the, the perspective of somebody who is awake because I have to be awake in order to, 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 to say it. And of course, there's a sense in which I'm not just pointing out a fact, I'm actually pointing to myself uh, with it. And that's, that's, of course, the degree to which I'm, I'm participating in the fact that's being um, uh, disclosed. Now, that, that's very different, by the way, from lucidity in dreaming, where people can realize in a dream that, oh, I'm dreaming. Right? Because you, you can realize you're dreaming and remain in the dream. There is nothing uh, pragmatically self-contradictory about that. Now they point out, and think of, you can just hear Socrates in this, they point out that this, I am wise, carries with it a sense, a very strong intuition of a pragmatic self-contradiction. To state that you are wise seems to be an indication that you are in a perspective and you have an identity that is precisely not that of being wise. Okay. And of course this is part of the Socratic, you know, I know what I don't know um, idea. This is part of, again, how I've argued, and this is why awe, right? Awe as the, this, this two-faced thing between horror and wonder, right? And that what it does is it brings out, and I, 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 again, I'm using this in the original meaning of the word, not what we mean by it now, right? Humiliation, the inculcation of humility, right? And so what that tells us right away, right, is that wisdom has, um, has this perspectival and participatory aspects to it, such that, right, it's not a matter of making, of, of even having true beliefs. There's a matter of what perspective can you take, what perspectives, what identities are you assuming and assigning? So the participatory and the perspectival are also uh, very central to wisdom. And that, of course, makes sense, again, with wisdom having to do with much more with the how than the what. And of course, this is also perspectival and participatory because I'm seeing through a misframing and I'm going through transframing. I'm actually right, going through developmental change. My world is opening up, and I, am, in a coordinated, resonant manner, am, am opening up to it and opening up through it, which is, of course, what wonder and awe are all about. OK, so that gives us some very important things to take note of. And I've already I find this, uh, this perspective to be a quite interesting one, uh, a pragmatic self-contradiction. Um, but I'm not sure whether I have that much to actually add to it, aside from the fact that I am going to add a, a wiki article on it and at, link it in the description. So as I s understand it, essentially the uh, idea is that uh, just as you saying something, I am asleep, is a uh, contradiction, that saying, but it still does actively con convey something, such as say, if you were to uh, write as your Discord status, I am asleep. That would be a, a pure example of uh, that. That would be a pure example of a pragmatic self-contradiction that serves an actual purpose. Saying "I am wise" is stepping into a non-wise perspective 
linguistically to say that you to say that you are wise to uh so it doesn't make sense in a kind of uh firm way it, it doesn't make sense in a straightforward logical way but at the same time it still very much uh can be practical for its usage in uh conveying things that is my understanding of it uh and I'll probably add to the wiki page later. He indicated a connection to Stanovich with the idea of paying attention to process rather than product. And we can strengthen that connection by noting that at the core of wisdom is the capacity for overcoming self-deception. Now Stanovich himself has uh, published about at least uh, overcoming foolishness um, and therefore at least by implication uh, what it is to become wise, but he normally talks about this ability to systematically overcome self-deception over an, with another term, and this is the term rationality. And throughout I've been proposing to you that part of what we need to do to rehabilitate wisdom is we also need in a coordinated fashion to rehabilitate what it means to be rational. Rational does not, cannot be reduced to, cannot be equated to a facility with syllogistic reasoning. Okay? R rationality cannot be reduced to logic. So, let's broaden the notion right away and make it connect to what we're talking about, which is what we mean by rationality is a capacity, capacity to overcome self-deception in a reliable manner. So what I'm going to mean by rationality is reliably and systematically, I'll, I'll, what I mean by those in a sec, overcoming self-deception. And this is also in a lot of the work on rationality, especially by people like Stanovich, and also affording flourishing, which is afforded by some process of optimization of your cognitive processing. Okay, what I mean by reliably, it can't operate according to a standard of perfection, completion, right, certainty. Reliably does mean, though, that it is a high probability of functioning successfully. Systematically means it's not operational just in this one domain. So let's compare being, let's compare rationality with expertise. Okay? I can become an expert in, let's say, tennis. I'm not, this tennis one in, I believe. My dysgraphia is bad today. Let's, whatever. Maybe it's two ends. I can become an expert in this. Okay? We have to be careful because we, we equivocate on this term. There is one in which we can, it's a, something that we can study, and one in which this is just a synonym for being good at something. Okay? I'm not using it in that sense. Okay, I'm using it in the sense in which it makes sense to say somebody is an expert in tennis. They have acquired a, a high proficiency in the set of skills such that they have an authority about tennis playing. Okay, that's what we mean. You can become a legal expert, etc. Okay? So, that the person, there is two ends in tennis. My brain is settling down. Okay? Or, in the law, for example, to become a legal expert. So, what happens in expertise is precisely this. You find, right, a domain, a bounded domain, that has a reliable set of very complex, very difficult, but nevertheless reliable set of well-defined, right, or at least well definable for you uh, eventually, set of patterns and problems. 
You know its expertise precisely because it doesn't transfer. My expertise in tennis won't transfer even to things that are close. In fact, it will interfere with when I try to play squash. My expertise in golf will interfere when I try to play hockey. Okay? That's not only does it not transfer, right? It will often interfere in transfer it even to things that are relevantly similar to your area of expertise. Now this is a way, again, in which we have to we have to pay more attention in ways in which we can bullshit ourselves. Because we often confuse, right, because we, we don't pay careful attention to how we're using similarity, we often confuse people's expertise. What do I mean by that? So here's somebody who's an expert, for example, in a particular domain, maybe in physics. They have expertise there. And of course, physics is about knowledge and about getting at what's real. And so that seems to be similar to, you know, philosophy, right? And so presumably somebody in physics can therefore just transfer their expertise to philosophy and just make pronouncements about philosophy and metaphysics, perhaps pronouncing that philosophy is dead or useless or some such thing, which of course itself is a philosophical statement and pragmatically self-contradictory. Yeah, I've, en I've encountered this so much, and these people typically do not uh, know much about, uh, about philosophy. And if we don't pay attention to this fact about expertise, we may fail to see that the similarity between physics and philosophy may actually be good reason for believing that these people are the worst people to listen to for philosophical advice because their expertise in physics may be in fact interfering with expertise in philosophy, for example, at least academic philosophy, just the way that expertise in tennis actually interferes with you trying to play squash. Okay, so expertise is, is not systematic. It is limited in its domain. Rationality is supposed to apply within, it's supposed to be apt within each domain and ac apply across many domains. Somebody, right, is rational if they can note self-deception when they're doing right, their daily life, where they're doing their professional work, where they're engaged in friendship, where they're engaged in rational, sorry, romantic relationships. Okay? So, and this is an important thing to remember, rationality is in this sense a domain general notion as opposed to a context specific. Expertise tends to be a domain specific. Now, of course, this is a continuum. The more systematic somebody is, the more rational we can claim them to be. Somebody might be very rational in a couple of domains and irrational in others. So, on balance, they're not that rational of a person. Right? And, of course, I'm not claiming that everybody is rational in a domain general way. I'm claiming that that is the achievement that we are aspiring to. So, rationality is to reliably and systematically overcome self-deception, also affording flourishing optimization. So you, get, you optimize a set of procedures for achieving the goals you want, but, and Stanovich doesn't talk enough about this. Other people uh, talk about this when they talk, like uh, Agnes Kollar when she talks about aspirational rationality. Part of it is also as you start to optimize your cognition, it will also tend to shift and change the goals you are pursuing. So the goals also tend to come under revision um, as we pursue this reliable and systematic overcoming of self-deception and the attempt to optimize our functioning so that we can afford flourishing. Yeah, this is this is how it is that this is what I would describe desire synthesis as being. 
So desire synthesis is my own concept independently, for, independent from, uh, <coughs> it's my own concept independent from Don Verveke's work, uh, or anyone else's work for that matter. Basically the idea of essentially uh, people, the idea that as people get older, they tend to, as people get older and tend to uh, approach, thing, approach things more systematically, they uh, have a resulting uh, shift where, they have a shift where they will uh, gradually make their, uh, oh, how do I describe this? Um, as people get older, they uh, will tend to have, they start out with uh, very unsynthesized desires that go all over the place, and then their goals begin to change to uh, become ones that instead of contradicting each other, will uh, synthesize with each other, and then that is uh, the concept of desire synthesis. So, uh, my theory, which I do not have, I do not really have empirical evidence for, is that, uh, is that basically desire synthesis, is, is that basically like a child will have almost no, almost completely unsynthesized desires, and so they will tend towards uh, not acting particularly uh, rationally. Uh, that is something that people will often consider to be a part of being rational. Um, they will, uh, when they're hungry, they'll try to eat. When they are thirsty, they will drink. When they, uh, and then people develop a, uh, overarching narrative, which, uh, which they use to understand themselves and their position, uh, in the world afterwards. Uh, so basically the... Idea behind it is that, uh, and so the idea behind desire synthesis in this way is that the, the idea behind desire synthesis is that, so the idea behind desire synthesis is that this gets is that when people get older, they will have stronger desire synthesis. I have mentioned this in uh, episode uh, 39, uh, and I, where I was uh, talking about, uh, about mythology and credo, and of which this particular image uh, was uh, used in it. I also mentioned the uh, I also mentioned the concept in uh, episode five on Plato's Lion at around the forty-eight minute mark, which I linked in the description. So I believe that desire synthesis is linked, among other things, to the uh, to the reason why it is that as people get older, they will see their dark triad traits go down, which is. Uh, it's not entire. It, this isn't to say necessarily that somebody with low dark triad traits will consistently. Uh, somebody with high dark triad traits is going to become a saint when they uh, reach a certain age. But it's saying that when somebody reaches a certain age, that but it's saying that they constantly go down, and I believe it's because. A lot of traits, particularly I'd say psychopathic traits, are a product of uh, people lacking sufficient desire synthesis. So they will tend towards not really. Uh, so people will tend to, uh, with those traits, not really. Uh, so people will tend to not follow. A consistent moral philosophy in their lives because they do not because they have insufficient desire synthesis and I see this as being linked as being strongly linked to wisdom and I see it as being something that is quite uh, quite quite distinct from uh, from standard knowledge
as it is a product not of some as it is fundamentally a product of somebody's uh, because it is fundamentally a product of somebody's uh, mind basically uh, putting things together in this way it is uh, I consider it domain general although I don't think that uh, people will always uh, although I don't think that people will always uh, have desire synthesis that goes in the right way I believe it's very possible for somebody to have a desire synthesis that say uh, makes them decide that they want to commit genocide uh, but I believe that the process itself is something that tends towards making people fundamentally better people and this process and as such the process itself should be viewed positively even when it can provide ne even when it can create negative results I believe that the discouragement of the process that sometimes occur, that I feel sometimes occurs on, say, uh, on, say, far-right intellectuals is something that uh, tends towards uh, making it so that they will uh, adopt more reactionary and harmful ideas because they will uh, be because if you synthesize your desires, then you'll generally lead to a, uh, a not necessarily a universal caring, but you'll lead to something closer to a universal caring. I, I think this is most important. This would be a des developmental psychology theory, and in order to properly test it, I'd probably need to actually, like, I probably need to do research on children, which is totally uh, within the realm of possibility. It's not a, uh, I don't think anybody would object to uh, such research. So I, I guess I would say in this respect, it is like the child, the sage is to the adult, the, the uh, I don't know, my, my dyslexia is, uh, acting up a bit, so I'm not able to fully grasp the way that sentence is supposed to go, uh, the sage, the adult is to the child what the, uh, what the, uh, sage is to the adult, that's, uh, that is the, Correct phrasing. The uh, the way to get uh, so I see it as basically being that uh, some people may have biological or otherwise reason biological cultural or otherwise reasons why they don't develop wisdom as well as others do, but everyone's in a consistent development of wisdom and that any form of desire synthesis is some and any form of desire synthesis essentially makes it so makes it so that somebody will act as a better person even if the results may uh, even if what they propositionally say as a result of it may be uh, may be objectionable this is uh, because it isn't a, I don't see it as being a propositional thing any more than the expressions of absurdity are propositional. They are, uh, they're a reaction to the, uh, somebody talking about, uh, say, Christian morality in a certain way isn't propositionally making the clip, they aren't propositionally saying that, uh, saying that this is the product of morality. They are saying that this is what, this is how it is that my mind has managed to synthesize my desires so that I am, uh, this is how my mind has synthesized my desires such that I am able to uh, 
hold to these values. This is, uh, so I think that a lot of the time, so I think in this respect, uh, giving people freedom of thought is a, uh, is often a thing that will just, that will make it so that they become better people, even if what they are thinking is something that is totally, uh, totally wrong or even superficially harmful. I believe that making it so that some, because it's not the propositions you should be looking at, it is the synthesis of the propositions, and people should always be, uh, or it is the synthesis of the desires, and people should always be encouraged to synthesize their desires, because it's all non-propositional procedural knowing that is then a, that is then represented to people as propositional, and in a uh, superficial way. So, but the thing is though, it is important. This is, these are, these propositions that people say, they are something that's generated by somebody who is engaging in proper desire synthesis. I believe that people can, and as we discussed with Credo, as we discussed with Credo and with uh, organized religion, People can collectively do desire synthesis, and it does help. But if somebody is just, re but somebody repeating something that they say, something that they hear, is not a manifestation of desire synthesis. The paradoxical result of this is that op is that oftentimes people who express a uh, eccentric and eccentric and sometimes problematic moral views. Uh, alone as a product of their own thought, I believe will as a result tend towards being people who are better people than the people who express uh, better moral views that are more, uh, that are things that they repeat because the people who eccentrically develop their own moral views, they're coming out of them as a product of their, uh, of their wisdom rather than the moral views being something that they are repeating. And organized religion ought to act as a scaffold, as uh, he will talk about in uh, wisdom communities. Uh, wisdom communities are a scaffold of which uh, we build our society, uh, or, or of which we build wisdom. But we also should build our society on that same scaffold, because we should have a society of wisdom. Okay, so given that that's what we're talking about, we can then take a look at Stanovich's work and other people's work. And the way to do this is to situate it within the cognitive science of rationality, and that is to take a look at the rationality debate. Okay, so the rationality debate was driven by a whole bunch of experimental results that seem to show that human beings are irrational. Okay? And ho how that works is, I, I, I mean, this is, I'm not going to go into this in, in great length, and I recommend you. Uh, read Stanovich's work. I'm just going to show you a, a couple of examples of the kind of experiments you do and, and then show you um, the features of them. So you give people certain uh, uh, problems uh, to solve and then you will you'll note certain things about um, how they solve them. So um, here's one problem, right? So here's a, right, uh, here's a pond of water, right, and I'm covering it, right, there's lily pads growing on it. It starts with one lily pad, and every day the lily pads double, right? So on day, day one there's one, day two there's two, and so forth. Every day uh, the lily pads are doubling. And then I tell you, on day 20, the surface of the pond is completely covered. On what day was the pond half covered? And people say, oh, on the 10th day, halfway through, it's half covered. No, 
right? On day 19, the pawn is half covered because on day 19, I'm, one, I'm halfway, right? Oh, the, you have to ask yourself, right? On day 19, I was halfway towards being, right, full because doubling of half is what gets me full. So it's on day 19 that the pawn was half covered by the lily pads. Now what's interesting here is notice how the machine, there's machinery like your insight machinery. There's machinery that's making you leap to a conclusion. It, sound, it feels like an insight, but it's actually causing you to misleap. It's, uh, it's, and we, we talk about this. You're jumping to a conclusion that's actually incorrect. Now, please note that, how that adaptive machinery that often causes you right, to have an insight is actually thwarting you in an important way. So, you know, people reliably uh, fail on this kind of thing, right? This kind of task. Or you can give people uh, this kind of task. You can get them to, you give a preliminary test and you find uh, propositions that they strongly agree with or strongly disagree. Well, let's say that so, some person strongly believes B. Well, you know, I, I'm not taking stand here on this particular issue, right? They may, you know, they strongly believe that abortion is uh, wrong or they strongly believe that capital punishment is wrong. Now what you do is you give them two situations. You give them a good in the sense of a logically valid argument that leads to not B that means not, um, I'll just put not in here. And you give them a bad, a very poorly constructed argument. So uh, on the lily pad thing, the lily pad, it's, uh, the lily pad is a uh, thing, it's uh, in a list of three questions that are often called the, uh, the best intelligence test, uh, or shortest intelligence test. It's a, there's other ones like a bat, and all, all of them revolve around essentially uh, your ability to pick up what's good, your ability to not jump to conclusions. I think the idea of jumping to conclusions is actually an interesting metaphor because I, uh, it makes me think of the, uh, of, of the word sin with its original uh, original meaning uh, in the which I talked about in uh, the episode on uh, Judaism um, which I think is yeah the episode on Judaism which I believe is uh, episode yeah it, yeah in episode three it uh, talks about the idea of I talk about the idea of uh, sin, and John Verveke talks about the idea of sin. So essentially, Torah refers to like to shoot a bow, and sin refers to missing. So it's a uh, so when you're jumping to conclusions, it is like you are sinning, or it's like you are tripping, as I would say, because I. As I would say in uh, my system, that leads to B. And you ask them, take a look at this and tell me which one of these is a good argument. And notice, notice what I said earlier, how this points to what Stanovich argues. That part of rationality is your ability to remove your fixation on the product of your cognition, that's like being locked in the nine dot problem, right? And be able to direct your attention and care about the processing for its own sake. This is critical detachment. And what you find reliably for many people is people will say, oh, well, this is the good argument. This is the good argument. They'll fail at critical detachment. Now, here's the thing. I'll give you a couple more of these. But notice, when I showed you the right answer in the pond example, you went, oh, yes, of course, of course. So you acknowledge the principle you should be using, but you don't actually reliably apply it. 
So you know what the right reasoning principle is, but you don't reliably apply. You know, you know that I should be able to independently evaluate an argument with, independent of what it leads to. Because if I can't do that, then there is no rationality possible. Because if you can't independently evaluate the argument, then you can't use the argument to evaluate the conclusion. And therefore, I could never persuade you by argument. So you know that you should evaluate the argument independently from the conclusion, but we reliably fail to do that. Do you see what the pattern is? We know what the principle is. We acquiesce in it when it is stated to us, but in experiment after experiment, we reliably fail to do it. Let me give you one more example. There is yeah, this is, a, uh, is something that, at least for me, because I'm uh, listening to the news a lot, um, it makes me think of the uh, Alaska primary where a Democrat won and the, and people are uh, it makes me think of the Alaska primary the, the Alaska election that just happened uh, where a uh, a Democrat won and Republicans are saying that a Republican should have won because of uh, majoritarian systems while uh, the runoff voting suggested that people didn't want any of the Republican candidates. Um, this is something that I say is a bit of a different thing. Um, I believe it's very much a lack of wisdom in this respect from Republican... Uh, I believe it's very much a lack of wisdom in this respect from uh, just general uh, Republican people. Uh, Although I will say that I believe that it's just an anti-democratic uh, push by uh, Republican legislators. They are trying to... Uh, they are trying to... Uh, but it essentially goes in this way where what they consider to be a good democratic argument is whatever it is that uh, gets them into winning rather than what uh, rather than the process itself this is something that's very very reasonable for people to hold um, I mean it's not reasonable it's the opposite of reasonable but it's not like somebody who believes this kind of stuff is evil it's just that somebody who believes this kind of stuff is falling for classic human foolishness. So, uh, generally, uh, I don't know how to change people. Changing people's minds is a complicated business, but I generally think that uh, probably higher educated people will be able to, uh, will be able to pick out the problems with this easier, but, um, it is a, but this is a particular uh, politically pertinent. Uh, this is a particular politically pertinent instance of uh, this phenomenon, and uh, it's honestly really weird to me because it is. Uh, it, it's weird to me to be re mentioning this and reference it because of the fact that uh, all this stuff was just unthinkable that there would be. Uh, mass questioning of election results and such uh, when when John Rebakey was making this video which was just like two years ago uh, th actually th three years ago now the uh, it's very very easy for us to fall into foolishness and it's uh, not and particularly and shaming people for it is generally not a way that uh, helps. I believe a large portion of our discourse is too focused on uh, Phil and Ikea, and as a result, it is not able to, uh, and as a result, it causes people alienation. This is... Uh, this is something I particularly want to try to train people away from 
with the Sanhedrin system. The uh, Sanhedrin system is going to is going to make people have less of a uh, emphasis on Phil and Ikea because you actually tend to work because the way that it will be uh, refereed and such will actually make it so that you generally will tend to uh, come out worse by uh, by focusing on the having mode instead of the being mode because it's a sacred uh, it's a sacred system that you are participating in rather than a uh, rather than just something political winning is metanoia is the uh, purpose of the Sanhedrin system and uh, yeah uh, let's continue so many of these look up the conjunction fallacy look oh, yeah the conjunction fallacy is a very uh, big a very big one too uh, that's a thing that's in large part responsible for conspiracy theories. I uh, talked about it uh, before in uh, probably a f in multiple ones of the uh, videos of this series. Um, I I searched through it in uh, multiple. Uh, uh, I. Uh, mentioned it in multiple parts of the series and I'm going to uh, link the episode in the description. It was the it was the episode on Gnosticism which talks about conspiracy theories. Look up confirmation bias, look up the waste and selection task. Some of you can read some of my work elsewhere. I'll give you one more example of this just because it's uh, again so interesting about this. Right. So here's a principle we all acquiesce in, I believe. Because I, I, whenever you ask people, they say, yes, yes, of course. That's the rule we should be using. Here's the rule. So I've got some evidence, and the evidence is the basis for my belief. Right? And then if the evidence is undermined, I should change my belief. Right? Of course. Right? Now, of course, we can have disputes about what counts as evidence, blah, blah, blah. But that principle, right? right? If the evidence for my belief changes, I should change my belief. Now, the problem, of course, with testing that experimentally is your beliefs are based upon all kinds of background evidence and information you've got. So testing it in a, an experimental situation is sometimes difficult. But this is what they did in an experiment, right? So what you do is you, you try and create a belief just in the experimental situation. So you're trying to create a new belief in the person right in that experiment. And so the experiment is actually the place in which you're providing the evidence. So what did they do is they brought a bunch of people in and they, <coughs> they uh, told them about this important skill that uh, they wanted to see if they possessed, which is the ability to detect uh, authentic suicide notes. Many of us have no experience with this and so that's why it's plausible, right, that this is going to be a situation in which a new belief is going to emerge. So the idea is I'm going to give you a bunch of notes, and you have to be able to tell me which ones are authentic and which ones are fraudulent. And this, of course, is a very valuable skill because it can help, you know, uh, with uh, first interveners. It can help uh, prevent uh, real suicide. It can help us determine people who are just faking it, or et cetera, et cetera. And so what you do is you give people a bunch of of notes and they, they make their judgments. I think this is real, no, I think this is fraudulent, and then you, of course, give them feedback, oh, yes, that's, that's right, or that's incorrect, right? And then what happens is, right, you later reveal to people the following thing has happened. People were randomly assigned to group A, randomly assigned to group B, if they were in group A, they were told they were very good at this task. If they were in group B, they were told they were very bad at this task. Of course, there's going to be a group C, which is the control group, and it's just going to be neutral, and you're going to uh, use them as a control. And I'm not going to go into that because that's just good experimental design. Right? And so these people come to believe, again, on the basis of the evidence in the experiment that they're good, these people come to believe they're bad. And now this is what you now do. Once you, you, you get them to reliably 
evaluate, like they self-evaluate and say, yeah, I'm good. Look, I keep doing well on this. No, no, I'm bad at this. I keep doing bad on this. Then you say, aha, then you debrief them, right? And you show them that they were, right, they were only getting the feedback completely randomly. You show them two things. All of the notes are fakes. All of the notes are fakes. None of them are real. And you were given the feedback only on the arbitrary, right, this, on the arbitrary fa factor, the completely random factor that you were just assigned to group A or group B. What that means, right, is the belief that you are good at this or bad at this should be completely undermined because the evidence for it, that these are real suicide, some of these are real suicide notes, and that I'm getting the feedback based on my performance has been completely undermined. Right, and now you give people a bunch of distractor tests, so they're doing other things, right? And then you come back and ask them, okay, but how do you think you would do on this in real life? These people reliably report, I'll be bad at it. Oh no, these people, I'll be good at this. Or you ask them, how would you do on a task very analogous to this? How you'd be able to distinguish between fraudulent and legitimate marriage proposals, right? Something like that. And these people say, oh, I'll be really good at it. These people say, oh, I'll be really bad at it. This is known as belief perseverance, belief perseverance, that people maintain the belief even though the only evidence for it has been completely, directly undermined in front of them. So once again, what do we see here? People acquiesce in a principle. They say, yes, this is the principle. Notice my language. I should use. I, sh I acknowledge and accept that I should use the principle that if the evidence is undermined, I should revise the belief. And yet they reliably do not do that. So again and again and again, you get all these experiments. And there is a lot of them. I've just given you three examples. And there are like, there's like 15 kinds of experiments you can run and, you know, tens sometimes hundreds of versions of these experiments, right? So people acknowledge the principle and then they reliably fail to engage in it. So, so I consider this to be a uh, product of the bioeconomy and how uh, essentially the relevance, of people's relevance of or perceived relevance of a certain uh, principle itself is something that is very... Uh, people's perceived relevance of a principle itself is something that uh, affects it. Uh, so people will... Uh, when they... Are, so I will link the uh, video on bioeconomy in the uh, description. Uh, the, the basic idea behind it is that essentially people can't actually afford cognitively to uh, people can't cognitively afford to actually go through all of the different uh, People can't cognitively afford to go through all of the different uh, things, uh, all their different beliefs and how they interact with each other, and then change it. They uh, so unless they are play, they have a consistent amount of relevance placed on the uh, placed on it, then they won't do it. This is a way that I believe I am particularly. Uh, eccentric among people because of the fact that I uh, actually, uh, because of the fact that I place more seriousness on it. Uh, I do not, however, consistently do this, though, but rather I consistently follow it in a, uh, I do not consistently follow this in all of my uh, actions, but rather I instead will consistently, I, I do not consistently follow this in all my actions though, but rather I place my philosophical worldview as being something that is quite a bit more important than other people do. And so getting things right is something that I, uh, 
So getting things right in this way is something that is much more much more relevant to me. So this doesn't apply entirely uh, in this way. This still has quite a bit of uh, even for me this doesn't always 100% apply. It just applies better for me on things that are pertinent to my worldview. So they suffer, notice my language here, from systematic illusion, systematic self-deception. All right, so a bunch of psychologists, cognitive scientists, and philosophers were coming to the conclusion that, well, that must, human beings are just irrational. Right? They're just irrational. And so this idea that we've carried throughout all of our history from, you know, Aristotle on that human beings are the rational, the rational animals, it, it, that's ultimately flawed. We're not. Human beings are not rational. Now, now that's very problematic, right, because Think about what that means. If you, if you were convinced that that was deeply correct, that human beings are not rational, then you'd have a very tough time justifying democracy. Because if human beings are reliably irrational, democracy is a very bad idea. You should, you should have the few people who are reliably rational and let them rule, for example. I'm not saying this. <laughs> I'm not advocating this. I'm trying to show you the consequences. You know, our legal... Yeah, this is a uh, particular uh, thing that I think that there is some basis to, um, except for that I also believe that, uh, except for the fact that I, I believe that uh, such an institution like that will not work very well because of the fact that uh, such an institution like that will tend to not work very well because even if they man if it manages to successfully uh, successfully select for rationality it will fail to select for inclusivity and uh, inclusivity a la why nations fail which I'm going to link another video on in the description I linked two videos uh, my video on Mexico versus USA and my video on Russia versus Scandinavia both of which talk a lot about uh, extractive versus inclusive institutions. And uh, I see this as being the probably the most fundamental argument for democracy, that uh, rationality is insufficient as a... Uh, the rationality is insufficient as a means of governance. But... and my solution is the Sanhedrin system, because the Sanhedrin system combines a enforced rationality with democracy where the uh, it's an anagogic democracy which uh, makes it differ strongly from uh, our current uh, democracy which I would describe as a spiraling democracy or catagogic democracy as uh, I think might be a, a good way of describing it. Um, I see a particular uh, element of democracy that's necessary being uh, being w not merely the synchronization of people, but what people are synchronizing on. If they are, say, if they're, say, uh, coming together based upon notions of, uh, if they're coming together based upon notions of, uh, say what they are angry about it will produce a very different political culture than if people are coming together based upon their higher virtues this is something i perceive as being a historical strength of the american political system in the in say the 1950s where people tended to be sort of virtue coordinating uh i don't believe they were doing it all on the right virtues but I believe that they were uh, 
I don't believe that they were coordinating entirely on the right virtues by any means, but I believe that they were that they were coordinating on virtue, whereas uh, I believe that they are not. But whereas I believe that once the perceived virtue system started to become more hollow, the virtue was the virtue became something that was perceived more in more as being a farce or as being oppressive as but and so somebody like say Hillary Clinton is a good example of the farce virtue which can then be uh, undermined by Donald Trump who is an example of the uh, of the lack of virtue which gets which people will feel as being freedom. The legal system is also based on the idea that people are fundamentally reasonable, reli reliably rational. But if that's not the case, can we hold people responsible for their actions? I mean... Yeah, I, uh, I definitely think... I hold to the view that essentially... Uh, I hold to the view that uh, responses to crimes should be uh, quite different. Uh, some people, some people will try to market this as being a uh, a rehabilitative system, but I personally think that it. I personally think that when you market it this way, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't get at the fact that I am. Uh, it doesn't get quite at the fact that I have such strong moral beliefs that are and such a uh, strong idea of the good life that is put in play with something like that. It is not a uh, when I'm saying something like that. It is emphatically not merely a uh, reflection of blind compassion, and that is something. That is something that a lot of people will have trouble explaining, and why I prefer using other terminology that is uh, other terminology such as a uh, anagogic penal system, as opposed. It's not that I oppose rehabilitative systems. It's just that I don't think that the uh, I think that they tend to come off in a I think when people talk about them, they tend to talk about them without having a concept of the good life, whereas my concept of a uh, anagogue penal system would be something that is intrinsically linked to a notion of the good life. Uh, this is why I may say that you're being sent to a monastery as opposed to being rehabilitated. Uh, you are being rehabilitated, but... Um, my perception is that it's so is that it's fundamentally linked to the concept of the good life and uh, that it is in many ways a authoritarian imposition of the good life which is something that i perceive as being actually necessary because we have such a disconnect from the good life within our world So I linked a uh, I linked the uh, article on monasteries in the uh, description. The, the way they're connecting evidence to belief to action is seriously, you know, problematic. Morality depends, and this is something that Kant famously argued for. Morality depends on rationality. People can only be held moral if they can also be deemed rational. Right? If, you, if you keep doing the right thing because of luck right, or because of coercion, we don't think you moral. We think, you, it, but if you do the right thing because you have reasoned it out and come to conclusion that that is the right thing to do, right, then of course we do deem you moral. So, as you can imagine, right, a debate arose, and this is a very good thing for science, right? 
See, notice w what's going on here with rationality. Rationality is, isn't just a fact out in the world, like whether or not the Earth is round, right? Rationality ultimately goes, because it is so deeply tied to perspectival and participatory knowing, it goes deeply to who and what I am. And that has implications for what kind of political citizenship I can have, what kind of moral status I can have, what kind of legal status I can have. Even your judgments, for example, if I'm mature or immature, are going to be vectored through how well you assess, how, how you, how you assess how rational I am. Rationality is a deeply existential thing. So, a debate ensued around wh this whether or not we should interpret the experiments or th what they are, and they're robust and reliable. They are not suffering the replication crisis, these experiments. So these experiments are robust and reliable, but there's a debate about, and there's always, and there always should be a debate in, in science about how you interpret your experiments. Should we interpret these experiments to mean that human beings are fundamentally irrational? Now, a debate ensued, and that debate is very important. And I want to go through this debate. Why are we doing this? Well, first of all, I'm trying to show you the deep connections between wisdom and rationality, and I'm trying to show you the existential and political and moral import of rationality, and I'm also trying to get you to consider expanding and revising the notion of rationality in a way that will help us to come back and deepen our understanding of wisdom. Why are we trying to understand wisdom? Because wisdom is deeply associated with meaning, and wisdom is deeply needed for addressing the project for, for, for cultivating enlightenment, uh, for the project of enlightenment and addressing the perennial problems, and also for the project of addressing the historical forces that have driven the meaning crisis. Okay, so the rationality debate. The first major response is by Cohen. And Cohen makes a very important argument. It's an argument that we, have, we need to go carefully through. And, and see, again, this is what I mean. There has been so much deep work put into the notion of rationality. We should not take the right, self-proclaimed promoters of rationality on YouTube to be clear examples of what rationality is. Okay? We have to do this more carefully, cautiously, reflectively, paying much more attention to the scientific evidence, the empirical evidence, and the debate. So Cohen... Yeah, the, the thing I found particularly uh, most notable is how uh, people, is how a lot of the promoters of rationality or self-proclaimed self, uh, promoters of rationality really do not uh, promote rationality. Uh, the skeptics community is the uh, the skeptics community are the ones that I will go most hard on on this uh, topic. They'll frequently uh, they're actually very strongly linked to all sorts of things that are will be perceived very uh, irrational irrationally by a lot of people. Um, Rationality is a fundamentally complex topic. And uh, it's and there's enough of a value judgment that's frequently attached to rationality that makes it so that people will frequently uh, use the uh, will frequently use the terminology in ways that do not really reflect what we're actually talking about. Cohen argued that there's a problem with concluding that human beings are fundamentally irrational. And his argument, 
comes down to a, a couple of very key points. So let me use this word because okay. Cohen says, okay, to be rational is to acknowledge and to follow a set of right standards. And we noted that, that the, we, we can only attribute irrationality to someone, something, if it acknowledges the standards and then fails to meet them. To say that this book is irrational makes no sense because it does not acknowledge the authority of those standards. So the fact that it fails to meet those standards is no reason for calling it irrational. The book is irrational. Okay? So Cohen stops right there and he says, well, let's slow down. Let's ask ourselves, where do we get these? The way he asks this is, how do we come up with our normative theory? Normative not meaning statistically norma normal here, but normative meaning the, the theory about the standards to which we should hold ourselves accountable when we're reasoning. So where does our normative theory come from? Right? And then he makes use of an argument that goes back to Plato and, you, and it, go, it goes all the way through to Kant and it's like, well, there's a, there's a deep sense in which reason has to be autonomous. Let's say I believed that um, my standards were given to me by some divine being, right? In the sense that, right, it is commanded of me. There is some Moses of, of rationality um, and the, the, he comes back or she comes back <coughs> with the commandments for how we're supposed to reason. So if we follow these just because we are commanded to do so, that is ultimately not a rational act. That is just to give in to authority, to give in to fear, and we would be doing the same thing regardless of what those standards were. Right? If we follow the standards because we acknowledge that they're good and right, that means we already possess the standards. This is an old argument that goes back to Plato. It's in the Euthyphro dialogue, right? Where, right, normativity has to be really deeply autonomous. If something is only good because the gods say it, then the gods aren't good in saying it. Look, if God says to you, do X, and X isn't independently good to do, then God saying do X does not make God good. Because it yeah, this was actually a, actually the very first thing that I, the very first ever book that I read in a philosophy class was the Euthyphro. It is very, very worth reading, and I'm going to uh, link it in the description. Yeah, we need it in that, yeah, when I was uh, writing my first philosophy paper on this, I took the position that essentially um, all uh, rationality and virtue could be conceived of as a divine command, but this divine command was something that was overriding and self-perpetuating. It would only make God good to say doing X if doing X was independently good. And if we only do something because we're commanded to do it, not because we independently accept that it is the good or the right thing to do, then we are also acting arbitrarily and not acting in a good manner. Right? So, right, we have to possess the standards. And this is an argument, right, a, 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 you know, crucial in Kant. Ration, reason is ultimately autonomous. Not in the sense that people misunderstand it, that it's like a god, or that right, it has right, absolute authority. It's that reason has to be the source of the very norms that constitute and govern reason. Because that's how reason operates. Okay, so we have to be the standard. There's a 
So I've normally interpreted this in terms of like an imposition of the will kind of uh, kind of idea, uh, like a, uh, and I still do think of it in partially in this terms as you will uh, get with certain ideas such as the, uh, as you'll get with me, my expression of certain ideas such as, uh, for instance, the, uh, the notion of You'll, you'll still get me uh, expressing these ideas in a lot of situations, such as, uh, for instance, my uh, imposition of the idea of, gen of Genki and uh, the uh, idea that it is, uh, the idea of Genki is, and its uh, inheritance from the Alpha is essentially a mythological uh, representation of this. But I've moved away from more of a hard uh, Nietzschean type approach to a more softer approach based upon this, uh, based upon the uh, more feminine idea of uh, of imposition of uh, the, the more feminine idea of problem solving versus the more masculine idea of uh, versus the more masculine idea, which would be. Uh, conceived of in terms of uh, in terms of conflict I can s when I'm saying masculine or feminine I'm not meaning to say it as much in terms of uh, making a normative or essentialist claim but rather having had decided on my gender identity was something that had played a major role in my decision of how to change how I perceive things in this manner. Another way of seeing this, ought implies can. I'm giving you two separate arguments for this idea. Ought implies can. If I lay a standard upon you, you ought to do this. Then you have to be able to do it. It makes no sense to apply a standard to you that you do not have the competence to fulfill. Okay? You ought to always say what is only certain and perfectly true. Yeah, this is a uh, this is something that is frequently used for say uh, debates about whether you have the ability to apply morality to say sexual orientation. It is a thing that I would argue often is a, I, it's a thing that I would argue often people apply unrealistic standards for one of two reasons. Uh, the uh, one one of the reasons is that people people say is that people want to somehow assert a position of control over somebody or dominance or something by making them unable to follow a standard, which it isn't necessarily, uh, which is actually a reasonable position to hold. Um, you can say that somebody say ought to, it is actually a reasonable position to hold, but I believe that it's often invoked as a, uh, as something I would describe as abusive in like a relationship sense with uh, people with how people will apply a, uh, a reaction to it. Um, and then there is also, there's also when people just do not actually think through their moral system as well, it can also lead to people imposing such restrictions. Such restrictions are ones that are not very, uh, Such restrictions are definitely not useful for any kind of a uh, practical guide for you to follow. And if you don't, you are failing. You're immoral in some fashion. Well, that's, of course, impossible. You can't lay on anybody the obligation to speak all and only what is true because everybody has false beliefs. Most of our beliefs are false. 
and nobody can act comprehensively according to standards of certainty. If I lay that standard on you, it's a mistake because you don't have the competence to fulfill those standards. Okay. So, and there, there, there's just so much argument that converges on this, I, this point. Okay, we are the source of the standards. That's, of course, why you so readily acquiesce in them. But then, of course, you should immediately say, right, but what the experiments show is, yes, people acknowledge the standards, but they fail to satisfy them. Well, then, Cohen does something very interesting. He says, well, we have to be careful. People make two kinds of mistakes, right? And, and what we have to do is we have to make a distinction between competence and performance. So let me give you an example. This goes back to Chomsky, and we talked about it when we talked about uh, systematic error. Let's do it again just to bring it back into the argument. Okay. Competence is what you're capable of doing. Performance is what you've actually done. You have a competence that greatly exceeds what you've actually done. You have a competence to speak so many sentences that you will never speak. Right? Right? So it is false that I have held my breath underwater for 17 days while listening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony with a company of super intelligent starfish. That sentence happens to be true, by the way. The fact that I uttered it is bizarre. I, I probably would never have uttered it in my life, right? So, the, but you have the comp I have the competence to generate it, and you have the competence to understand it. So competence is what you're capable of doing, performance is what you actually do. Now the thing is, in between your competence and your performance, right, there are all the implementation processes. You remember this? So I have the competence to speak English. But if, I, if I'm extremely tired, the implementation processes, the English in me, doesn't, it comes out garbled. My, I, I start slurring my speech, or right, perhaps if I was very drunk or something. Now you don't think that when I'm very drunk or very tired that I've lost the competence. You just think, rightly by the way, that there's something interfering, interfering with the implementation processes. Right? But if I get in a car accident and my brain is damaged and I, I'm slurring my speech all the time, then you go, oh no, John's lost English. It's a different thing. Right? Now, Cohen does something really clever here. He says, how do we come up with this? Well, we have to be the source of it, and it has to be something that we can hold ourselves to. Odd implies can. Okay. So where do we come up with these standards? Well, what we do, this is how we come up with all of our normative theories. What we do is we look at our performance, and we try to subtract from our performance all of the errors in it that are due to implementation, implementation errors or as if they're often called, performance errors. Errors in how I'm implementing my competence. And so what I do is by this process of systematic idealization, I try to come up with an account of what my competence looks like completely free of performance errors. So what would I have to have in my head so that I could reliably speak and understand English all the time in a perfect manner? Now of course, all the time I'm speaking, because of implementation processes, there are performance errors. You, I, I sometimes stammer, I sometimes stutter, there's gaps, I, I, I speak elliptically. Notice there I just went, I, I, okay? Those are performance errors. And you read through those, right? So what we do is we take our performance, we put it through a process of idealization, we try and subtract all the performance errors that come from the implementation, and then we get a, a purified account right, of our competence, an idealized account in that sense, that it's, it's purified of uh, distortion by performance errors, and then that is the standard to which we hold ourselves. That's how we come up with a normative theory. That shows how it, we can be the source of it, 
and how we're ultimately capable of it, but how we can nevertheless, a lot of the time, fail to meet it. So what he argues, brilliantly, but we're going to see there's going to be problems with it. He argues that all of the errors in these experiments have to be performance errors. That all of the mistakes that people are making are like the slips of tongue that pervade my speech. They're performance errors. Because why? People have to be the source of the standards, and they have to be able of meeting those standards. So we must have, at the level of our competence, all of the rational standards. We must be, at the level of our competence, rational beings. And the, the, only, mis the only reason we're making those mistakes is performance errors, which means that human beings are not fundamentally irrational after all. They are rational. Now, what I want to show you next time is what's right about that argument and what's deeply wrong about that argument, how Stanovich and the work of Stanovich and Rust right, re reply to this argument in a really brilliant way. And what it's going to show us, again, about the nature of human rationality. Human rationality is much more comprehensive than facility with syllogistic logic. Right? It is the reliable and systematic overcoming of self-deception. And that right, right, has to do with us not just right, sort of, sort of uh, theoretically. It has, to, it has to do with us existentially. And therefore, this notion of rationality deeply overlaps with, and I'm going to argue is a component of, what it is to be a wise person to be able to systematically see through self-deception and into reality in such a way that, like rationality with wisdom, we can actually afford meaning in life. Thank you very much for your time and attention. That video was uh, was quite good, and I think I managed to uh, mi I think I managed to do uh, my response to it quite well. I think that uh, having doing one a day is a uh, good shift, especially now that I'm uh, less. Especially now that we're through a lot of the stuff that I was trying to rush to get to. It is uh, better. So, yeah, I would uh, the this these kinds of questions of whether humans are rational or not, they uh, they fundamentally go back to the idea that humans are an autopoetic system, and as such, humans have the tendencies and ability to build rationality. We do not, we are not necessarily always rational, but we have the ability to build it. And that is the thing, that is the thing that we should be seeing as important in ourselves. We are the, people oftentimes look at humanity and it's, uh, stru people oftentimes look at humanity and it's, uh, people will oftentimes look at humanity and its uh, role in the universe as though we have a uh, as though we have a uh, sterile rationality. Uh, Descartes' idea of rationality is what I describe as a sterile rationality. Whereas, by contrast, I believe that we should be uh, pursuing a uh, pursuing what I would call a uh, creative rationality. Uh, we have our what makes us unique and special as humans is the fact that we have creative rationality. Creative rationality is what allows us to, say, create scientific theories, to uh, develop wisdom, etc. This is not something that I'm... I'm not going to take a particularly humanist perspective on this, as I am not a humanist, uh, but 
this creative rationality that we have is what we really should be valuing rather than uh, rather than the uh, sterile rationality of Kant or particular Kant is actually a little bit better on it I was thinking about Descartes Descartes has what I would describe as the most sterile form of rationality, and I'd describe somebody like, say, Ben Shapiro as uh, venerating the sterile rationality to the venerating the, the sterile rationality at possibly the greatest extreme that he could be doing. Uh, sterile rationality is not useful in itself. Sterile. Sterile rationality is about tearing things down. This does relate, and I think is slightly parallel to, uh, to some culture war criticisms of saying, like, progressives just want to destroy. Uh, I, th I would say I think that this is actually warranted, um, but I think an issue is that... Uh, but I think an issue with it, though, is that uh, part of this is due to the marginalization of the creative voices on the progressive side, rather than the progressive side wanting to destroy. Uh, I am a example of a creative voice on the uh, on the progressive side, and uh, if and the right would probably kill me if they knew about my existence. So. Um, yeah, I am going to uh, I'm going to react to the next video tomorrow, and I hope that you enjoyed this video and that it got you to Omega.